welcome to another special episode of the Blues Focus podcast. I'm Kieran, your host for this episode. Joining me this week, I've got our regular podcasters, Elliot and Callum, and also joining us, the Blues hero that is Paul Robinson. Paul, thank you for joining us on this episode tonight. Um, before we get into the questions, though, I just want to start off and obviously touch on the news yesterday about um, Papa Boob Diop, obviously one of your former teammates, just uh, if you could just give us a bit of an insight into what he was like as a character in the dressing room, really, and what it was like to play alongside him. Yeah, obviously terrible news. Um, so young, still 42. Um, great guy. Fantastic guy around the building. Um, he was nicknamed the wardrobe for the size of him, uh, What he, like his strength, his power, um, but such a genuine guy and, and so down to earth. And you could have a, like just normal chats with him off the field just like anyone else. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's just an incredible loss to everyone at the moment. And I think we're still struggling to cope with that. He's actually gone up, got, he's passed away at the age of 42. Yeah, no age, is it really? And, you know, it's, it's, it's such a shame. It was a shock to read yesterday, to be honest. Yeah. But obviously our thoughts with his family and his friends at this time. Um, cracking on, I think, Cal, I think you've got uh, the first question, haven't you? Yeah, um, hi Paul. Having signed a short-term one-month contract at Blues in 2013, yeah. did you expect to go on to make 175 senior appearances and then join the coaching staff as well? No, I did not really, because you don't look at it that far. I mean, for me, it was month to month, so um, it was it was quite strange. I'm not going to lie; I've never experienced it before in my career to uh, to be on that sort of contract. But I love the challenge and. I knew that I had to give my all every game, every training session to, to, to earn another, to earn another deal. And yeah, I mean, it got to, I think it was three, four months, I think to the end until I got offered a contract till the end of the season. And then it was just from then on, then it was year after year. So, I mean, so grateful that I got to 175 games. I mean, um, it was an absolute pleasure to play for the club. I, I loved every minute of it. And again, to captain, a captain such a fantastic club was, uh, I mean, special memories for me, yeah. Paul, well, how you doing, mate? Pleasure to talk yeah. to you. Um, obviously, Lee Clark brought you to the uh, club in 2013. What, what, how would you describe him and what was he like to play for? Yeah, he was a character, Clarky. I mean, um, just so passionate. I think that's when I first had a phone call with him. Um, obviously, he called me. After the, the, he had loads of defensive problems and loads of injuries that happened, and he, he gave me a call. And he said, "Look, Robert, he said I'd like you to come in training. Uh, we need to have a look at you just to see how fit you are." So, from the, a minute I put the phone down, obviously I just knew what I was going into, and, and that was I was going to work for a guy who just he was really passionate and cared about the football club, um, and I love working with him. Such a great guy, honest. Um, there was no hiding. He'd let you know how it was, uh, even at my age, and I love that. I like that. I like. I like managers being honest with me. If I'm not performing, I want them to tell me. If I'm not doing things right around the training ground, I want them to tell me. And, and Lee was definitely one of those managers that I, I had a great bond with. Um, and I think, obviously, his passion got the end of, uh, got the end of him in the end. He, obviously, the owners didn't see how he was going to take the club forward. But he was playing on a, on a shoestring budget and he, he wasn't given the money that he wanted to bring certain players in and he had to go into the loan market. So, yeah, it was quite tough for him. But... I had a great relationship with Lee and um, I'm very grateful for him taking me to the club at the time. Just uh, yeah. mentioning on um, on Clarkie's uh, passion mm. quickly, mm. Uh, one thing that I've seen as recently as this afternoon was his uh, celebration after the equaliser against Burnley <laughs> when he decided to uh, cave in the, the, the advertising boards. Uh, did the lads give him a bit of a, a ribbon for that in the dressing room afterwards? Well, I think I think we left him to uh, to calm down a little bit. No one, no, no one wanted to say anything just in case he carried on in the dressing room. Um, I think he was more worried about his shoes. He, I remember. I think I remember him saying is that it, they were brand new shoes that he just brought, and he weren't too. I think he weren't too bothered about the hoarding boards. I think he was uh, worried about scuffing his trainers while he was sticking them in it. So, uh, but yeah, but that but that just showed what type of man he was and and how much he cared. Some people might have looked at it. He was a little bit over the top, but. He was a winner and throughout his playing career, he was that type of player where he always wanted to win and he was going to be no different as a manager. Yeah, I, I mean, I love working with him just because of the fact is that he, he just cared so much and he, and he, and he did. He, he loved every player that walked in the football club and he took a lot of attention to detail with them as well, which was great. Yeah, I mean, that first season, 
it, Lee Clark did quite well. He obviously come he come with a good reputation from Huddersfield. His first, I think, it was his first year in management, wasn't it? And yeah, um, I think that that first that one particular performance that that first season, Sellers Park four nil. I was at that game. I remember you played centre back that match, and you formed quite a good partnership with was it Curtis Davis at the back. Curtis, yeah. Um, so was that was that um, was that quite sort of pleasing that you slotted in so well and so quickly? Yeah, I just think look, wherever Lee wanted me to play. Um, obviously, I knew when I first come in from from the um, from that short short term contract is I was just filling in for David Murphy because he was out injured at the time and. I mean, what a fullback Dave was. He was he was such a good fullback, and he's just unfortunate with injuries. So um, I come in as just basically just to cover the the, the gap until David was back. Um, so I sat on the bench then when David was back. But it was great for me because I love just being around teams. I love the camaraderie, the togetherness. So that's the type of character I am. Um, and then obviously Stevie Caldwell, then who played centre back, was going through a bit of a rough period. And I think the whole game obviously was was the turning point where he wasn't too well, but he was he was not having one of his great games. And Clarkey just lost the plot and he, he literally dragged him off and put me in at centre-half. And it sort of carried on from that game, really. And I'd played with Curtis at West Brom, so we both knew each other's games really well. Um, so, yeah, for me, it was it was just going in and, and using my head, being professional and, and doing the best job that I could possibly can for the team. <laughs> just want to mention as well, obviously... Um, and ask you about the uh, game away at Bolton, <clears throat> last game of the season. Yeah. Um, two nil down with what fifteen twenty minutes to go. What was it like to play in, in that game? And obviously, just describe the emotions at the full time whistle when you obviously discovered that you'd, you'd uh, kept us up. I think it was um, obviously it was a weird situation to be in because we should never have been in that position at the time. Um, Going into the game, obviously, we, we were really looking forward to it because we we knew that we could beat Bolton and that was the way we looked at it. But obviously, we knew we just had to, to get a result knowing that, um, was it Rotherham at the... No, sorry. Was it Rotherham? Uh, Doncaster, I think. Doncaster, sorry. Doncaster. Yeah. Um, yeah. Had a sneaky bit on it. Um, so, we knew that Leicester would, would obviously go into the game knowing that they would win it. Um, so, we didn't actually realise on being 2 nil down and making it hard for ourselves to try and get back into the game. But... I think we showed the character and that we showed the togetherness of, of what it had been like. It had been a roller coaster season for everybody and all the emotions and obviously all, all the setbacks that we'd had throughout the season, it, it came down to that one last game. But we showed, we showed that willingness and with the fans being there, it, I, I don't think, the, obviously, the fans don't really hear it much from players, but to have you guys right behind us and, and the way that you lift us, it... it you are the 12th man, no matter where it's, whether at home or away, because we knew that you would sing your hearts out and you get right behind the team throughout for 90 minutes. So we knew that, but we knew as a great group of players that we had to step up. So 2-0 down, obviously, we get a goal back. Um, obviously, then the nerves in the crowd of, 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 like, we know that we can sense them, that we can get back in this game. And then, obviously, just to see someone like Paul Caddis popping up without ever... It, it felt like an eternity with him jumping in the air to hit that ball in the goal. It would have been different if it was someone like Ziggy, but when you're watching Caddis jump for that ball, it just looked like it was going to take ages and Bolton's defenders were going to get there. But when it hit the back of the net, I mean, it was just elation. And you've seen at the end of the game, Lee Clark running down the touchline, what it means to not only like the fans, to the players, but to the people that work behind the scenes, the ones who don't get to see everyone, where we see them every day and, People have got to pay mortgages and they've got, they got to earn their living from, from having their jobs. And to know that they were going to be safe and, and, and we'd, we'd got ourselves over the line. I mean, don't get me wrong. If we, had, if we hadn't got over the line, then I would have seen the club in big, big pro problems. Maybe close to administration or liquidation you're looking at with the times that we were going through. Um, but just to see everyone's reactions and then obviously to, to really appreciate the ones behind the scenes who do all the hard work that no one really sees. Yeah, just buzzing for them. And uh, I mean, I like I, I think I got caught on YouTube, didn't I, when Paul Caddis was getting interviewed with the old... Uh, I'm not going to say it again, but yeah, a few <laughs> were, were, were blasted out. And, but that's what it meant. It meant, it, it meant a, big lot to, a, a big deal to me to, to keep the club in the division. And yeah, it was just a lot of emotions and finally we could let it out because we'd just survived by the skin of our teeth. I think all of us can say we remember exactly where we were when 
when uh, the full time whistle went. I mean, I was at my partner's house in Blackpool watching it on Sky Sports News and she told me she was looking at it on her phone that we'd equalised and I wouldn't believe it until it came up on the teller. And I think I sprinted, done about 10 laps of the living room and then just decided to cry on the sofa. So, you know, <laughs> massive, massive moment in the club's history and like you say, potentially saved us from, from worse things. Yeah, definitely. 100%. Of being awarded the the 2014 Player of the Season, obviously your thoughts on being such a a, a popular figure at the club in in such a, sh a short amount of time. So how did that feel, and sort of how big and how much did you enjoy your, your relationship with the fan base? I loved it. Obviously, I had to win you over to start with. I'm not going to lie; it was um, again, but I've had to do that of every club I've had to been at because obviously. My um, my reputation wasn't too uh, too good with the Blues fans when I first signed, um, for numerous reasons. Uh, but but that's the way football goes. I, I I respect that, and everyone has their opinions on me. That's that's the way I was as a player. Um, whether I meant meant to to hurt anybody going into the challenge, no, not at all. That's that's not the type of person I am, and um, it, it's just it was just one of those things that I I do. I get very very withdrawn by when I, when these things happen to certain players from from my tackles. It's not nice. So, yeah, I, I knew that when I was going into Birmingham, it wasn't... Um, I had to win a lot of people over. Simple as that. And, obviously, the season for me, at the end, getting, the, getting obviously, everyone's vote for the player of the seasons and fans' player of the seasons, it was, I was truly honoured and shocked because... I just went in there as a, as a free transfer of, uh, to help Lee Clark, to help everybody that was involved with Birmingham City and use my experience and, and my knowledge in the game to try and bring people together. And, and it was fantastic. I loved every minute of it, even though it was emotionally draining that sometimes I, I loved the challenge of, of bringing people together and, and seeing what it means to a lot of people. And, and I think a lot of players connected with the fans a lot better after that as well. I, I think it's important, and I don't. A lot of players don't get this now, and this is what annoys me: is that a lot of players who sign for football clubs don't take too much notice on what what the fans are all about, what the clubs all about, the history. You have to do your homework when you're signing for a team. I did my homework on all the teams that I signed for, was knowing that you had to have a good relationship with the, with the fans. You have to give your all, no matter what. Yes, you're going to play badly, but you've got to show that you're giving 110 percent. That the fans see that, and you've got to have that that connection with them off the field as well, where you're doing certain things that you have to go out and meet them, you have to go and sign and stuff for them. Totally, I totally agree with everything that that's all about, but I just don't think footballers really appreciate what fans are all about at football clubs. So, yeah, for me, it was about bringing everyone together. I think, I think Paul, you've pretty much answered my next question. I was going to, I was going to quickly ask about, you know, was there any worries on your part after, obviously, the incident in 2006 with Damian Johnson, like, you know, obviously it's one of those things, it's in the heat at the moment, but um, was there any concerns when you joined the club? I know it was, you know, it was some time ago, you know, previous to when you joined. No, not at all. I didn't have any concerns because it's a, for me, it's a big club. It's a big club that had been struggling and I wanted to go in there and I wanted to give my all. I wanted to prove to people what I was all about. Um, I wanted to prove to the players, to the staff, what type of character I was and how I, how I could bring a lot of people together. And I felt I did that probably... That was probably why it was more emotional, emotionally draining for me the most is because I put all that effort into trying to win a lot of people over. And to win the awards, yeah, it all come out in the end because it was hard. It was really hard um, yeah. for me, my family, because my family took a lot of stick as well. I, I, I'm thick-skinned, so I can take a lot of stuff in football because I, I appreciate fans' opinions. They all have a right to say whatever they want to say. Not, not a problem. But when it comes to my family, when my family gets abused and my kids get abused at school and, and by other people, then that's that's where I draw a line on it, and I don't I don't appreciate them sort of things. So so yeah, for me, I think it was a, it was a lot of emotions that I'd come in and I'd and I'd won a lot of people over, which was great. Yeah, definitely. I mean, obviously, one of the the major talking points amongst the fans whilst she was at the club was the surprise. Uh, removal of Rowett as manager, um, replaced with with Gianfranco Zola in such a short amount of time. What was the reaction in the dressing room like when that happened? Because obviously it took us all by surprise, really. Everyone was devastated. Um, Gary had brought a, a togetherness. We just lost eight 0 to Bournemouth, 
And Gary come in, Wolves away, our next game, tough game. And we ended up going there and drawing nil-nil. But you could see straight away what Gary had implemented on the team and, and what he wanted from every single player on that football pitch was to, to leave everything out there and stick together when the going gets tough. So Gary come in straight away and, and put his stamp on it and, and got us organised with how he wanted us to play. And we knew it was going to take time for our attacking players to get involved in games where they'd score a lot of goals. But it wasn't as long as what it's taking now with Karanka, unfortunately. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it's uh, the players sort of straight away connected with Gary and could see what he was doing. Um, and we loved it. We loved the time under Gary. And we'd just beaten Ipswich 2-1 at home on the Tuesday night and we was in for a call down on the Wednesday. Gary wasn't in and we sort of found it strange that the manager wasn't in. Um, but we then found out that he's obviously... He had other stuff planned for the day and the rest of his staff who was working there, they'd come in to take the call down and to take the other lads. So Gary needed to have time off as well with his family and do other stuff. Um, he didn't need to be in every day. And then we got told to stay behind after training. And we were like, what? What are you talking about? So obviously the club secretary at the time, Julia Shelton, was sort of a little bit upset. So we was all looking at her thinking, why are you upset? What's, what's going on? And she couldn't tell us. She said, the manager's coming in. And we were like, manager's coming in it's his day off so yeah Gary Gary came in on his day off he came in and told us that he'd just been sacked and we obviously all just sat there didn't know what to say everyone's heads down thinking what the hell's going on no one's explained to us at the football club just a decision that the owners had made and the board had made to to part company with Gary Rowett um we still don't know the explanations of why but we're assuming it was because of his style of football that that they didn't really like, but we were getting results. We were, what were we? We were fourth, fourth in the league at the time. Two points off the automatics, I think, if I remember rightly. Yeah, two points off automatic promotion. And for me, just to make a change like that is um, strange. But I had that as well. I, I had the same at West Brom with Brian Robson. Brian Robson was the same. We got relegated to the championship and Brian Robson, we were sick at the time and he got the sack and Tony Mowbray come in and took over. So, it's football, it's owners. If they, if owners feel that the club needs to be taken forward in a different way, then they, they pay the money, they put the money into the club. So you have to respect their decisions in what they want to do and how they see the club moving forward. But we, we felt at the time that Gary was moving the club forward. Yeah, the, the club seemed to be heading in a good direction under Gary Monk. Would you be able to tell us much about the circumstances with his departure last summer? Well, not really, no, because we was away. We was all on holiday when it all got decided that Gary Monk would left. Again, similar mould to Gary Gary Rowett with the way he'd organised the teams. Obviously, Shay Adams was on fire. Him and Juki connected well as a partnership. He'd got the team well organised, playing well, scoring loads of goals. Um, obviously, the points deduction was a little bit of a kick in the balls, but he dealt with that. As a manager, he, he, never, he never complained. He never sulked about it around the training ground. He kept everyone motivated. The players always kept positive. Um, and it was one of those things where we survived because we needed to survive, but we survived well enough knowing that we'd just taken a nine-point deduction. So uh, not a lot of teams in that position, I don't think, do really well compared to what Gary done with a team. Um, but again, owners made the decision that they wanted a different style of manager in and they wanted to move the club forward in a sense of, this entertaining football that they wanted to create. And again, it, it failed. It didn't work. Um, obviously, strange situation. Again, with Pep, wasn't it? Um, towards the end of last season, you know, announcing that he was going to leave. It, it got leaked, um, you know, post-lockdown. And then do you, feel, do you feel like that manifested itself into the performances on the pitch after, after lockdown? Yeah, because as players, you, you, you just don't know what's going on. Obviously, you, you've got to be as professional as you can as football players. I mean, I was on the coaching side so then, so I wasn't around it. I was with really the 18s at the time. Um, mm. So you could see the frictions in the first team that whatever decision had been made by Pep, obviously, he'd had, he'd had enough as, as, as being the manager of the football club. Um, but it was just so strange. Literally, we just come out of lockdown. I think it was one or two games into it back and then the decision was made that he was going to leave at the end of the season. So you can see the point of view as players that that, the, um, that they're not going to be fully focused because they don't know what's going on. They don't know what decisions are going to be made. The owners, were they going to get rid of him there and then? Or they say they left it longer than what they should have. 
Um, and the club, again, just literally survived, which this club shouldn't be doing. Birmingham City shouldn't be just surviving. It should be competing at the top of the table, fighting for pro- like promotion to the Premier League. You get just a quick question as well, uh, off the cuff. Like, do you feel like the owners are learning from some of these strange decisions that they've made in previous years? Um, I mean, is that something you could say? You know, I don't know. Or... I, I don't know. You'd like to think they are. You'd like to think they're learning. Um, obviously, Karanka now has come in. Um, are people happy with what he's doing at the moment? On a defensive point of view, yeah, the, the team's not conceding goals, but they're not scoring goals now. And I look at the squad that they've got, and it's ridiculous. The squad, the squad of players that Birmingham City have got now, they should be destroying teams like with their attacking force that they've got. But it seems like they're not being used in the right way, or they're not being they're not being utilised to 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 getting them on the ball in certain areas of the football pitch to go and like express themselves as football players. Because if I had players like John Terrell in, in the football team and Sanchez and Bella and and obviously this new Alan who's come in, Juki, Hogan, I mean, probably one of the strongest attacking forces in the championship when you look at it compared to like the Watfords, Norwiches, the teams that are up there, it's but they're not they're not they're not producing. Mm. I mean, and then, the owner, and then there's fans. Do you look at the owners again? And do you, the owner Dong has come out and base. He, he has said we want to be playing free attacking football. I don't. I don't see that. I don't. If you, you don't, if you're the owner of the football club or the CEO of the football, you don't say that stuff. You you don't come out publicly and say I want to be playing because then you're there to be shot down because the fans are not seeing that. That's that's the problems you've got. You got to play smart. You got to but again. Is Don getting advised by football people? I don't think he is because there's not enough football people at the football club. There's not enough people at that football club who who played the game and understand the game. Yeah, I think we all agree with you on that one. I think it's an interesting appointment in the sense of Don obviously has always wanted attacking football. Obviously, if you mentioned it when we discussed the the Rowett sacking, uh, mm. the style of play that Rowett played wasn't what they had in their vision for the, the team, really. It then obviously makes you beg the question, you know what Karanka's about before you appoint him. You, we've seen it at Middlesbrough, at Forest, how he sets his team up, how he likes to be compact, solid defensively. It's a complete contrast to what Dong has in his in his mind, isn't it, really? Yeah, but, but you've got players there to defend. I don't, defenders now don't like defending. This is the problem with football, and it's not just at Birmingham, it's every club. Like, how can you not be a defender and not want to defend? It's like, it's in you. It should be in you. It should be ingrained in you as a defender. Is I am not letting you pass me today because I want to keep a clean sheet. I know they're keeping loads of clean sheets, but that's because they've got five bodies at the back, six sometimes. So no one's going to get through you when you've got six bodies at the back. But then you're also taking out the midfield quality in, in Ivan. You, Gary Gardner sitting on the bench. Obviously, you've got Keith and Bell there, who, again, for me, he's, a, he's an excellent player, but he's wasted. Keith and Bell's wasted at the football club. Over the years, he's been a great servant and he scored some unbelievable goals over the years when I was there as well. So he's he's not even involved. You've got the, that San Jose who's there as well. Yes, OK, he's a big signing from Atletico Madrid on a free, but you've already got midfield players there that can do what he does. So it's it's picking and choosing. And again, you're taking away the attacking quality you've got in the team just to sit and try and keep clean sheets. Expose the team and let the defenders defend. That's what it's all about. Let the defenders defend. Do you, do you, do you think that these owners will give Karan for the time? You know, it, with this approach so far this season, you know, it is very I'd negative. So. I'd like to yeah. think so, yeah, because he's renowned as a, as a top manager who's got teams promoted. So it's yeah. going to take time. You, you just can't push the button. You can't push the button as soon as everything starts getting bum twitchy time again. You've got to yeah. stick with him and you've got, to, you've got to see it out with how he wants the team to perform. Yes, it, they're in, again, they're in a transitional period because they bought loads of players. But you've got, to, you've got players there that can destroy teams in this division without a shadow of a doubt. But they're not. They're holding on for draws or they're losing. And yeah. that's, the way, that's the way I'm seeing it. And it's sad because I was there for eight years and the club means a lot to me now. And it was ingrained in me to do well for that club. And I set foundations for myself within the club to, to go on and, and move forward. But it hasn't. And it's not for some reason or not. Yeah. I mean, we talk about obviously giving managers time, i.e. Karanka at the moment, but obviously one manager that that kind of was on a 
hiding something from the off vice Gianfranco Zola. Um, yeah. Obviously, the, the renowned was it one or two wins in 23 games we had under him. What was it like in the dressing room at that time? Obviously, just defeat after defeat, really, and, and, and not really seeing an end to the run. Yeah, it was horrible. Um, it was horrible at the time. The feeling, losing, the confidence of players was low. We, we're going into games. I think the opposition team sensed it. They sensed that, that we get a goal. We're not going to fight back. We, we're going to be like uh, caving. Um, so, yeah, it was just a horrible... And I felt for Jan Franco because he was such a nice guy. Such a nice guy. But when you've got... When, when a manager comes into to a club that has um, been well run by Gary Rowett, then it's always going to be a hard task to follow in a manager like that with how he's organised the team. Again... I don't think Jan Franco did the transitional stuff really well. And I think he'd admit that himself is maybe that he shouldn't have gone all out attacking to start with, with the players that he had, because he knew that we didn't, we couldn't do that. Um, and I think he should have just built on his time with the players that he had there. And, and then gradually, then as, as he went on, he maybe could have brought the players in that had that extra flair and extra quality that would, would unlock teams in the right way. Yeah, I think, I think touching on that, uh, with Kieran touching on Zola I mean I think he had the right idea of wanting to play attractive football I remember quite a few games we, we played three at the back wing back style uh, mm. I remember you playing centre back in a three a few times it looked uncomfortable um, but we seemed to knock the ball around quite nicely but just weren't solid at the back were we? No yeah well we just it was just getting used to that formation because we we went yeah. from a four to then a three and we kept changing. If you're gonna if you're gonna do a formation, you've got to stick to it. Simple as that. So the players know they all understand their positions. They all understand what their what their responsibilities are on the football pitch. And I I personally believe that three five two is a great formation to play. It's it's just coaching the players to do that. Um, and I think obviously with Jan Franco, his confidence took a hit because we were losing. He then wasn't too sure what formations to play, what players to play. And it does, the pressure as a manager, and Birmingham City as well is a big club. So you, you're going to feel, you're gonna feel <laughs> even more pressure when the fans start coming down on you, which, which, which heaps it all on you as well as a, as a man. So with Gianfranco, he's, he's that type of guy. He took everything to heart and he just, I just think he just, he just got too much from him in the end and he just didn't know what to do to turn things around. In one of the sort of things I seem to remember from... I think it was Gianfranco's time. Was obviously the there was a bust up after one of the games we involving NCU and was it the coaching staff? I believe, if I remember rightly. No, no, it wasn't the coaching yeah. staff. Was no, it not? he was trying to split it up. But yeah, I, I mean, Emilio, Emilio and Shots were again two great guys to have around the dressing room. But it, again, when you when your confidence is being hit, um, I think Emilio's the type of guy. He's so passionate that he takes things the wrong way sometimes and. Nothing was said out of order to anyone. It was just, we were talking about the game on the pitch and then Emilio just thought someone had said something and it just all blew out of proportion. But when you're trying to control a player on the pitch in front of all the media that can see it, it's, again, it's, it's just the wrong time, bad timing for everybody. So again, that comes down on you as a group of players and, and the management staff that you can't control things. But we were trying to control things behind behind closed doors and trying to get it all in house that we were doing things properly and doing it right. And unfortunately, that 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 explosion just come out at the wrong time. But it was it was just players letting steam off, having their say, um, getting off their chest, but not in front of the media or on the football pitch. Yeah. Beans. Go on, Callum. <laughs> Being as experienced as you are with your sort of coaching output on, do you see a sort of, not improvement, because we've probably not seen enough yet, but do you see Karanka getting it right? And what's your sort of views on it? Where could we be in the next however long? I just think, I just hope he's given time. What's he, is he got, did he sign a three-year contract? Yeah. I think that, yeah. that three years got to stay three years. So we got, you've got to see what his plan is, what his ideas are. Um, you can't change it again. Because um, it shows then that the club's not moving forward and it's not going places. If you're going to keep chopping and changing managers, then there's no there's no stability. There's no there's no time for another manager to come in with again players that Crank has brought in. He's going to come in and want to bring in his own players. So it's all change again for everybody. So I feel that they've got to stay with him. Um, I do think it will take time. 
I think it will take time for the players as well to get used to the way that he, he is as a manager and what he wants. And I do believe that the attacking threats will come out eventually because the quality is there for all to see. And it's just letting them go, letting them, letting them be released and letting them, in, letting them enjoy themselves in the final third. I, I, don't, just, I don't see why the, them sort of players are defensive, being trained, defensive-minded players because you're not going to get that from Leco. You're not going to really get that from Sanchez because you're taking away then their good, their good game and their their qualities, which are going to be in the final third of the pitch, destroying the opposition teams. If if they're defending in your half too much, then it's too much for us for them to get 60, 70 yards up the pitch with a little bit of quality then because they're just going to be tired all the time. I mean, we're seeing under Karanka at the minute, aren't we? That's similar to what we saw under, in a, under Zola in a sense in the terms of he doesn't really know what formation to, to go with at the minute and it seems to be prefers five at the back in the away games and, and four at the back in the home games. But do you think it's he's got to settle on <laughs> one solid formation and move forward with that, do you think, going forward now? Yeah, I think he's got to. I think he's either got to play 3-4-3 three, three, or he's got to play 4-3-3 because three, three, you've got the players in there to, to cause problems. I know the fans would probably like to see um, another strike up there with Juki, but... You've got you've got the attacking threat there that can just play in and around Juki and 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 play off him all the time. It's just using them using them well, using them in the right areas of the football pitch. And I've said this about numerous teams, but as not not just Birmingham, but Watford are the same. They've just come down from the Premier League, and the quality of squad that they've got have not been using their attacking quality in the right ways. And Birmingham's the same for me. It's it's getting them to all gel together. But he has he's got to stick to one formation, and he can't keep changing it. It's and he's also got to pick his best team and stick with it. Uh, the chopping and changing of players, again, it's there's no cohesion there. There's no consistency with the team because it's there's constantly three or four changes in the game. What's what's next for you? And do you fancy uh, football management eventually? What's what's your movements at the moment? So at the moment, I'm just enjoying family time. Um, obviously, did the 23s, did the 18s at Blues, and really enjoyed it working with some of the top young players at the football club was it was great to spend some time with them day in day out watching them improve each day watching them get that mentality of what football's all about which is which is massive for me is that these young lads nowadays need they need programming of what football's really all about and and how hard it is and, and what you need to do to become a professional football player so so yeah i absolutely love my time coaching there with the boys um and now i'm just enjoying some family time 24 years i was in the game so I needed a break as I was getting, I was getting a little bit annoyed with certain things, um, things that I didn't want to, I shouldn't be getting annoyed about, and I didn't want to keep bringing it home all the time when my family was seeing me upset and annoyed. Um, so yeah, I'm enjoying the break, looking forward to Christmas with them all, all the kids and my wife, um, and then hopefully again get back into into the game after the new year um, and see see what jobs are available. So you wants to, to try and take me on and, and, and give me a chance. But yeah, ideally, I'd like to be a first team coach. I'd love to have the experience now of working in and around the first team and developing that side of my, 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 um, my coaching skills. Um, and then hopefully one day, if it, if it comes around, if I get a, the chance to become a manager, then yeah, I'd love to. I'd love to have a chance. I think I remember going to one of the games that he was in charge of the under 23s. Uh, I think it was a cup game in, against Kozel Town. Yes. In, in Kozel. Yeah, I was, I was at that game. I remember that did finish yeah, quite boring, wasn't it? Nil nil. And did we win on penalties in the end, I think, if I remember rightly? No, I think we lost on penalties. Oh, I can't remember, to be fair. Yeah, but, uh, I think, but yeah, I remember that game. He was uh, barking instructions all game from the touchline. Yeah, that's it. To... That's that's when Lee Clark was um, really good. Lee Clark saw what type of person I was, and he seen the influence I had on the players, and he wanted me to take the game. He was like, "Robo, look, I really want you to take this game tonight. So, can you take it for me? I'm going to sit in the stand. Um, if I want you to make subs, obviously I'll let you know. But but other than that, I just want you to take the game and enjoy it and see what you think. Um, so that was a great experience for me. Obviously, my first time being on the touchline coaching. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Obviously. Again, then, having the two years that I've had recently with the 23s, having great success with the 23s, and then with the 18s, it was always going to be tough just because of the fact is that they're young boys and they're coming into a, a different environment, just leaving school and 
I don't think the boys really appreciated how hard it was going to be for them and what I was going to be like as a coach to push them in, in, in the sense of this is what professional football is all about, lads, and you've got to get used to it quick and getting that winning mentality. So, yeah, I, I mean, I always felt that I would go into the coaching side, but um, like you say, doing the 23s and 18s probably grounded me in a, in a good sense of knowing where I really, really want to be, and, and that's I really want to be working with, alongside a first team sometime now. With the... Um... Sorry, with the uh, you know, obviously being a Watford boy, would the ultimate ambition be to go back to where it all started, uh, coach or possibly manage? Yeah, I mean, I'd love to. I'd love to manage one of the one of my old teams that I'd play for. I mean, it'd be it'd be great for me. Um, obviously, I always had that connection with the fans. I think the fans understand the way that I am as a person. I think they'd see the way that I'd work and what I'd try and do. Um, so yeah, if the opportunity arose one day, then it'd be hard to turn down one of them teams. Definitely. I think some of the Blues fans idolise you for just giving uh, Gabby a kick. Yeah, <laughs> love that. <laughs> That's all you have to do. I'm taking a fellow for that any time, not a problem. Man. <laughs> you can, the eight years don't matter, it's just that one moment you was already in the in the, uh, the Heroes books for us. <laughs> yeah. I know they're the old, uh, I miss them I miss them local derbies they're the ones they're the spicy ones that you all love playing and definitely they were the games that they got the best out of me as well I really enjoyed them I thought like as a player they brought the best out of me my leadership qualities as well apart from obviously the uh, the James Chester incident where the owner stitched me up massively there but hey if that was the way he was going to get me out of the game then he done himself. He done himself proud with that one. Going to the FA about that one because it was embarrassing the way he done it. Um, but that's football. That's what people try and do to take out. Like you say, I was the captain. Try and take your leaders out. That's what they try and do. So yeah, one of those things. But no, they were they were great games to play. Love them. I mean, the other moment in the the derby matches that stands out was um, Molyneux. Um, yeah. I just still think it's a bit unfortunate with that that red card in the end. Yeah, what, if you look back on it now and... Which one? The Bob Varson one? Yeah, yeah. On the touch one. <laughs> like, literally, it was a joke. The funny thing about it was is that Andy Hinchcliffe was doing the game on Sky and I was suspended and I was then doing... I was doing a game the week after. So, he saw me in the... In the obviously, he saw me in the, in the tunnel and I just walked past and stared at him and I went, have you got something to say to me, Andy? Like that. Because obviously, it had been rescinded. Um... And he was like, I'm really sorry, Robo, because obviously I'd come out on Sky and said that you rabbit punched him. But when you look back on the other camera angles, you hadn't touched him. You literally just pushed him off you because he was on top of you. And I said, yeah, I said, look, but, but this is what cameras do. Cameras try and show you in your worst light of, of how to make incidents look even worse than what they are. But again, it's, it's part of football. It's, it's the passion. It's when you go for a tackle, they're not, they're not made to, to go out and hurt people. It's just, it's just the way the game is. It's the emotions of coming out on top and trying to be the winner of it and cameras make them look a lot worse than what they are unfortunately I think we're seeing we're seeing that at the moment aren't we with VAR like the, you know everything's slowed down and it's yeah. just making things look so much worse yeah I think it's like it's, it's just embarrassing now to the game and a prime example tonight I think the first time I've seen it work, work really well was the, the, the Leicester Fulham game where the referee let the game play on until, the, until it had stopped for him to go back to the, the cameras to see it was a penalty. But mm. how many times are we seeing where it's taking so long and the referees are wasting time? It's like five or six minutes, whereas that was done in like two minutes. Literally, to come over, look at the screen quickly, penalty, there you go. But he let the game play until, until it had stopped. So it was perfect. That's how it should be. Let the game flow mm. and then make the decision when the time's right. But again, it's... The people in the rooms, do they understand football and do they understand what it's all about? Because they should be in his ear by saying, when you stop play, it's a penalty, by the way, or that's a red card, that's a yellow card, go, go and book him. It's just giving them like little messages in the earpiece that referees don't see sometimes, but also keeping the game flowing. So, so we're, we're not getting annoyed as fans or as viewers that, for God's sake, we're going to sit here now for five, six minutes and see this decision be, be the wrong one or is it going to be the right one? No one ever knows now. I suppose you being a defender, you'd have a different view to, to some of the viewers sometimes. But, um, I mean, you see a prime example being Salah at the weekend. Do you really think that when the offside's so tough, it's so close to call, do, obviously they always say give the attacker the benefit of the doubt. Uh, obviously, you might disagree with that back in your playing days. 
Well, you give well, no, because it was you, you always give the attacker the benefit of the doubt of what he was going to score with his body with, which was either going to be his foot, his head, or his knee. If you were going to use your arm, you're not offside because you're not going to score with your arm because it's a, it's, a, it's a blatant hand ball. So, them little rulings that they keep gauging with the lines, and you're taking the job out of the linesman's hands as well. You're basically saying to the linesman, you're not fit enough because you can't keep up the play, whether it's an offside or not. So these decisions now, you, you've got to give it the benefit of the doubt for the striker. If he is leaning forward, but his feet are level with the defenders, he's onside. Simple as that. He's literally onside. We're just, we're just making the game like, it, it's just becoming embarrassing now with how the game's rule, rulings go and no one really understands them because they keep changing now with the handball rule as well. It's, if it hits your hand, it's a penalty or if it's by your side. It's just so many grey gray areas that no one can really understand with what's going on. Yeah, definitely. Well, I think that's about all we've got time for on this episode. But thanks again for agreeing to join us, Paul. It's been great chatting with you. Hopefully we can get you on again at the end of the season. Hopefully have a um, positive end to the season and we can get you on a chat about that. Um, yeah. No worries, yeah. fellas. Good to speak to you. Pleasure, mate. Pleasure to talk to you. Cheers.